Good afternoon, everyone. Judith, thank you for the introduction, and thank everybody for taking time out of your uh, busy schedules, and I'm sure we have a lot of out-of-towners for visiting, and I want to thank you for attending the um, museum, uh, the 9-11 Tribute Center, and most importantly, taking time out right now, being corralled and asked to come into this uh, auditorium. Um, what I'd like to do with everyone uh, in the next uh, about five, seven minutes is to actually share my story on the morning of September 11th, 2001. I just finished up, as Judith said, my 18-hour tour, and I was informed uh, by my detectives that a plane has hit the tower, and my bosses from downtown here in one police headquarters informed me to handle the investigation. So I came down with a detective, very close friend of mine, Kurt Harris. As we were driving from Jamaica, Queens to this area, we heard on our radio that a second plane has now hit the tower. I looked at Kurt and basically said, Kurt, we're at war. Uh, this is no accident. This is no uh, medical difficulty with the pilot. This is an act of terrorism. We got down, we arrived, and as we're approaching Lower Manhattan, uh, hundreds and thousands of people are literally running, walking hastily away from this area. And as the emergency vehicles were approaching this site, they actually stood off to the side and was waving us in. And in 30 years of my experience with the NYPD, I never ever saw something like that before. They're actually helping us to get down to the site. I parked literally on the corner, right off of Liberty Avenue. That's where our car parked. So I'm entering the, the um, plaza, Next thing we know is I, our emergency service officers. Emergency ser service is called, there are ESU. On television, you hear them as SWAT. Uh, when a cop needs help, that's, all you, that's who you call, ESU. And they were running from the building saying, Joe, get out of here, the building's gonna come down. And how they knew that was because we're on the same frequency as the NYPD aviation unit, our helicopters. Our helicopters were hovering above they couldn't land because of the smoke, but they can start to see the tower actually start to move. So on their frequency, they alerted, clear the towers, get out of the towers, it's gonna to come down. You might have heard about the controversy that all first responders were not on that frequency. The fire department was not on our frequency. They did not hear that. Police officers were running out. When they approached me and they said, the tower is gonna to come down, I look up at the building and I say, How? to myself, within seconds, what do you mean it's going to come down? Where am I going to go? Where am I going to hide? What am I going to do? All of a sudden, like an earthquake beneath your feet, the earth starts to tremble and a loud, loud roaring sound occurs. What do I do is I dove underneath one of our emergency service trucks and I try to get my body under there so in case I did die, I don't want to my face is ugly enough, I didn't want to get crushed on my upper extremities. So I tried getting underneath the uh, truck. And after a few minutes, you get up, it's surreal. Just like it is in this room right now, you heard nothing. Except the problem is you could see nothing because the smoke you could not see in front of your five fingers. After a few minutes, I saw my partner, Kurt, we hugged each other, we made it. I didn't know where I was. I thought maybe I was gonna be going up to meet my maker up in the sky. I don't know if I'm in the clouds or what. But then we started seeing people. And this one woman, I'll never forget, approached us, covered in ash, we're all covered in ash. And all you can see is her eyes blinking at me, staring at me, just blinking. And with her eyes, she's telling me basically, I can't speak to you, I can't talk, but please help me. And that's what all the first responders did that morning. We try to help as many people as we can, except what we were up against was raging fires. The building before the collapse was raining down paper and fire from the jet fuel. When it collapsed, all the papers, imagine two towers over 110 stories tall, where when they came down, their debris is over seven stories tall. Our streets in this vicinity were on fire. It lit up our rescue trucks. Over 1,000 emergency vehicles were gone. So prior, when the fire is coming down the streets, we try to load in the rescue vehicles of the equipment. 
We need oxygen tanks. We need hoses, picks, tools, whatever we can grab on. And we threw them in through all the alcoves of every building that's in the vicinity of. And we do is what we could do. We were all one that morning. Fire department, police, all one. Port Authority, all one. And we try to search and rescue as many people as we can. And bottom line was, a detective friend of mine comes up and says, Joe, we got to look for Danny. We just lost Danny Richards, a bomb squad detective. So I asked, where did we lose him? On the other side. It took us 45 minutes to get to the other side by Building 7. We couldn't get in that building because that was about to collapse, and it shortly thereafter did collapse. To get detectives clawed Danny Richards' body out, we were able to get him out until April 15th, and this is the morning of September. Our guys either made it out or they didn't make it out. Very little aided cases at the hospitals. The hospitals were prepared for the worst but there just weren't many people coming into the hospitals. Not many were injured. Yes, they did have quite, you know, a number of injured, but not in the numbers that we're thinking. And in total, everyone knows that ultimately we lost close to 2,800 victims, where you're going to hear from James very, very shortly. 2,800 victims, and to this day, the identification process goes on through the use of DNA technology. One third of those victims will not be identified because they literally vaporized. And we try to identify with the advancements in technology on a regular basis. Most recently from last March, just past March 15th, we still made an identification. And why is that important? Because it provides closure to the families. So I performed over close to 2,400 hours here at Ground Zero from the morning till uh, we broom swept it clear. And what motivated me was the families, the families of my friends. We lost 23 police officers, seven of them which were my personal friends. We lost 37 Port Authority. We lost 343 firefighters. To this day, our men and women from the first responders are still dying. We lost a lot, dozens through cancer, direct cancer-related injuries and illnesses from ground zero, and that death toll is just going to keep on increasing. So with that, I hope you enjoyed, got a good feel of what we went through as a city here. And in closing, my most two famous words is always, never to forget. Never to forget, and wherever you come from, whether it's from overseas or here in the United States, when we have our legislators that come in to start changing our laws, please think of intelligence purposes. Please think of intel to gather information to prevent a disaster like this. Um, this, ha this could happen anywhere in the world. We hope it never happens here again. And with that, I want to thank you for your undivided attention. Thank you.